Yes, it's on. Kate Saunders is the research director for the International Campaign for Tibet. Kate has specialized on Tibet as a writer and journalist for around 15 years, advising academics, parliamentarians, and government ministries. Kate will discuss China's ethnic minority policies in Tibet and Xinjiang. She'll explore Tibet's relation to the current Xinjiang crisis, where the CCP has imprisoned over a million Uyghurs, Uyghurs, Kazakhs, and others in internment camps. Please join me in welcoming Kate. Thank you all for inviting me. Very esteemed audience here. So, uh, academic audience, so thank you for very much speaker. for coming. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so, I'm assuming you can all hear me if I just stay yeah, sitting yeah. here, cause, so that I can um, do the pictures. Okay. So, I'm going to talk today, um, as um, introduced, about the, the, I'm basing the talk around this very chilling statement that you, you see here, which is um, from an official document, and it's stating that the objective of the party's aim, the objective of the party in Xinjiang, is to break the lineage, break the roots, break the connections, and break the origins. And that was in an official document that was obtained by AFP some months ago. So the, the horrifying reality of what's unfolding in Uyghur areas, East Turkestan, Xinjiang is of course a contested term, is becoming ever more apparent. It's a, a complex system of incarceration and de-extremification that's being built in the region where Chinese authorities say that they're combating the extremism through education. And China, as we know, has attempted to keep these camps shrouded in secrecy. It's been refusing to provide statistics on the number of people they contain. They've been refusing to open them except for, obviously, very um, managed, controlled, stage-managed visits um, and <laughs> choreographed official tours. And on one of the recent ones, as you may have seen in the media, um, detainees sang, if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. So the first accounts of witnesses came from Kazakh people. Um, so a Kazakh woman called Gulzira testified in March that the first thing she remembered from her experience in the camps was a Chinese official saying that she needed to be re-educated. She underwent the following. She was shocked with a stun gun to the head for spending more than the allotted two minutes in the toilet she was handcuffed for 24 hours because guards accused her of letting another woman participate in religious washing. She was forced to make winter gloves as well. She and fellow prisoners, she said, were not even allowed to cry because that shows evil thoughts. Those with grey hair had it dyed black for dignitaries' visits. So people outside Xinjiang first began to learn about the camps in 2017 and that was thanks to some really excellent open source research by academics including Adrian Zentz and uh, also the Canadian Sean Zhang. They traced massive camps uh, being built in the desert encircled by high walls and topped by barbed wire. They also monitored government tenders for police uniforms, riot shields and helmets, pepper spray, tear, tear gas, neck guns, stun guns, electrified batons, spears, handcuffs and uh, also spiked clubs which are known as wolf's teeth. And a lot of these implements um, have been used also in Tibet since uh, 2008. And there was one article by Agence France Presse that uh, reported on um, a rise in the sale of the so-called tiger chairs used for torture um, and to restrain and interrogate um, suspects. So we know of um, the use of tiger chairs from the Tibetan prisoner Golok Jigmi. He's uh, talked about his ordeal in the tiger or the iron chair. He described it as really the worst form of torture he experienced during his three periods in detention. So back in 2017, Uyghur friends, Uyghurs abroad were really alarmed when friends and relatives dropped out of touch, um, first deleting phone and social media contacts and then disappearing entirely. Um, and one Uyghur in London, Rahima Mahmoud, who many of you may know, um, she said that uh, the last contact she had with her family, I think in January 2017, 
her brother said to her, you go with God and we will go with God again uh, as well. And um, that was the last that she heard of them. So according to scholars, to the US State Department, to the United Nations and other research, um, these camps hold at least a million Uyghurs, also others, Kyrgyz, Kazakh. And they may be the largest mass incarceration since the Holocaust. Um, Secretary of State in the US, Mike Pompeo, said recently that China is in a league of its own when it comes to human rights violations. Now, it didn't mention, he didn't mention the Nazis directly, but um, his top officials compared this roundup of the Muslim Uyghurs to movements into camps not seen since the 1930s. So this issue is rightfully getting a great deal of attention now. Uh, front pages, New York Times, other newspapers, several hundred scholars, I think the number now is around 700, have signed petitions in solidarity. Um, it's still, however, not a major part of diplomatic or political dialogue. Um, and I think that's epitomized recently the New Zealand Prime Minister who um, gained a lot of respect globally for her reactions to the um, terror attacks on the mosques in New Zealand when she went to see Xi Jinping. Uh, not only did she sign up to the One Belt, One Road, but she didn't even mention the, uh, the Uyghur camps to Xi Jinping. So thanks to the painstaking research and the courage of those who have borne witness, um, the crisis in Xinjiang has really brought human rights in China back onto the global agenda, onto the forefront. So moves to challenge China on the global stage now are crucial and far from detracting from the significance of Tibet issue, it really does cast in sharp relief the oppressive measures that were trialed first in Tibet and the threats that China's networked authoritarianism now presents beyond its borders. So policies in Xinjiang can best be understood in parallel to those in Tibet. And the policies we now see in uh, Xinjiang have their origins in Tibet. And as we attempt to really understand the, the ideological DNA that underpins the unfolding horrors in Xinjiang, um, I would single out two important developments in recent years. The first is what happened in Tibet in March 2008 and what it led to. The second is a harsher new policy direction regarding non-Han minorities which has never been publicly announced or heralded. So before 2008, Chinese officials sought to project the notion that only a handful of Tibetans, mostly monks and nuns, caused unrest in Tibet, influenced by the Dalai Lama. But in 2008, prior to the Beijing Olympics, of course, Tibetans across Tibet risked their lives, their futures, their safety, to assert that the Dalai Lama represents their interests and not the Communist Party state. And as all of us here know, Tibet propelled this issue of China's policies on the plateau to the forefront of the international agenda at the time. So governments began to take Tibet much more seriously. Um, and that was an approach that was compounded by the wave of self-immolations that began in Tibet in February 2009. So immediately after the crackdown on March the 14th, 2008, the Chinese authorities accused the Dalai Lama of orchestrating the unrest in Tibet. And they accompanied this accusation with a major campaign in the Tibet Autonomous Region to oppose the Dalai Lama, implemented at every level from the top down to the grassroots and linked to the CCP's broader anxieties over the erosion of its influence in Tibet. And Tibet, we see now, is, is not a minor issue to the Communist Party. Tibet is regarded as a core issue of the PRC's territorial sovereignty and also, importantly, as a matter of national security. And I'm just showing a few images here of some of the protest activity um, that we saw after 2008, which united all sectors of society across Tibet. So, and then this just takes us to um, a broader summary of, um, of why 
this is all happening, which is that uh, China's strategic objectives in Tibet are, um, are multifold. They are linked to, of course, security of the borders. Um, and that's why it's perceived as a national security issue. Um, it's linked to building up the major industrial cities at the foot of the plateau, like Chongqing and Xi'an, into major industrial centers linked to the now the One Belt, One Road global infrastructure campaign. And it's also very importantly linked to water because Tibet is, of course, the world's highest and largest plateau. It's an epicenter of global climate change. It's the source of most of Asia's major rivers, and Beijing and northern China are very, very are suffering a very dramatic water scarcity, which in some areas is uh, is equivalent to that of the Middle East or or worse. So the Tibetan plateau, of course, roars out of the map. Um, and uh, over the last few days, I've actually been tracking and mapping some of the hydropower stations that are being set up on the plateau and. Um, it's, it's, uh, these are very advanced, literally reshaping the entire, land, the entire landscape and very few people are actually tracking those, those developments. That's one of the um, major dams that are being built upstream. So, and uh, the, the new development of two uh, very important new developments in terms of Ch Tibet's importance to China um, the power grid was established in Tibet last November, um, which will link to the PR, or it already has linked to the PRC's national power grid um, for providing electricity to Chinese cities, um, and a new train line which is going to be built from, um, from Chengdu to Lhasa um, across an area which is um, much more significant demographically, environmentally, than the existing railway from Qinghai. So, as in Xinjiang, where an entire ethnic group is targeted, as opposed to individuals labelled by the control state as extremists, this is a real shift in approach. And the Chinese government is seeking to replace Tibetan loyalty to the Dalai Lama with complete allegiance to the Chinese party state. And in doing so, as Sering Wosa has put it, to obliterate memory um, and undermine Tibetan national identity at its roots. And as a result, hyper-securitization and militarization are really not deemed to be enough. Mass re-education or conversion um, have become an integral element of the new policies. So as Ma Jian says, the Chinese writer in his new book, China Dream, which I really recommend, I'm reading it at the moment, he said, China's tyrants have never limited themselves to controlling people's lives. They've always sought to enter people's brains and remould them from inside. And it was the Chinese communists in the 1950s, of course, who coined the term brainwashing, which from the Chinese term, which literally means to wash the brain. And Xi Jinping has reinvigorated ideology to an extent not seen since the Cultural Revolution. Um, China watcher John Garno, who was a, a correspondent in Beijing, who knew a lot of the Beijing princelings, um, as he says that politics isn't everything, but there's no country on earth like China where it's more omnipresent, with the exception of North Korea. There's no political system on earth that is as tightly bound to ideology. And uh, John Garno, in the work that he was doing for the Australian government, he initially went out of his way to remove um, ideology from his analysis on how China was impacting on Australia and the region because he found that this alienated people. Um, it was easier to, to normalize events and concepts by leaving Communist Party ideology out of it and framing them in more familiar terms. But this approach of normalizing China, he found, also served to sidestep important debates about what China is and what China is becoming. It was taking the Communist Party out of China. And I think that what we've learned in, in uh, recent months and years is if we are ever going to read the ideological roadmap, that frames the language perceptions and decisions of China, we need to read the ideological DNA. 
And to understand China's policies on Tibet, we need to read the ideological DNA. So it was really after March 2008 that this war against successionist sabotage was launched. And soldier-turned-politician Chen Guo, chief of the Tibet Autonomous Region from 2011 to 2016, developed his methodologies in Tibet prior to his transfer to Xinjiang, where he now serves in the same post. He's been there since 2016. So in Tibet, he developed one of the world's most dystopian police states. This is a recent picture from Redcon that was circulating on WeChat. Surveillance technology by the biggest CCTV companies was combined with the deployment of tens of thousands of party cadres in monasteries, schools and homes with the aim of literally rewiring Tibetan thoughts and beliefs and giving rise to fears of nothing less than obliteration of cultural and religious identity. And this new approach was developed in several stages, which I'll very briefly run through. So following the unrest in 2008 and the crackdown, the Chinese authorities adopted a much harsher approach to suppressing dissent. And there was a significant spike in the number of Tibetan political prisoners in Tibet. Torture became more widespread and it was directed at a broader section of society. The second ongoing phase of the authorities' so-called stability maintenance drive involved this transfer of, Tibet, of party officials to Tibetan areas in order to run propaganda and surveillance operations. And this, this phase is way more than just a simple crackdown. Um, this is something much more sophisticated, much more terrifying, and Chen Quang Guo was, was directly involved in that. So by 2009, the CPC was embarking upon the training of a new generation of party cadres at a grassroots level. Between 2011, when Chen took over, and 2015, more than 7,000 party cadres described as outstanding um, and members of the TAR party were sent to 1,707 Tibetan Buddhist monasteries to expand party work and more than 20,000 party members and cadres were sent to other villages and townships. And we interviewed a party member from uh, Shigatsi who carried out um, some of this work and this was a Tibetan farmer in his 50s who was recruited by the CPC. Um, and he told us this a few years ago, he said, the most difficult thing for me is that I have to give names and details of individuals who are politically suspicious and who should be the target in my village in order to maintain social stability. If there are any political incidents in my village, county leaders would come with police and I have to tell them exactly who is involved. So some people are then detained and, uh, and that person will then become a target in future. So this is not a nice job. Some people are, also I have to make sure that people do not talk at all about the Dalai Lama. More recently, we party members have been told to monitor individuals' daily activities to see who is the most influenced by the Dalai or who is dreaming of Rangza and the return to the old Tibet. My job is to lead villages in the right political direction. So mass de-extremification camps that we're now seeing in Xinjiang were presaged in Tibet under Chen Guanggu's leadership. And that, was, that happened in 2012 when hundreds of Tibetans were detained for re-education when returning from a major Kalachakra teaching by the Dalai Lama in, in 2012 in India. And this was a highly systematic operation. It involved preparation of military camps, of schools, possibly of also prisons, to hold thousands of Tibetans upon their return. Um, couples and families were separated while they were in detention. Elderly people were denied medication. And the detentions in general, according to a Tibetan from Lhasa we spoke to, imposed unbearable psychological and financial pressure on families and communities. And three years later, in 2015, Chen Quang Guo boasted um, that by then no one in the Tibet Autonomous Region had left the country to participate in religious teachings by the 14th Dalai clique in foreign countries. 
And at the same time, which was also around 2012, the Chinese authorities began to compel monks and nuns studying in Qinghai and Sichuan, for instance, at the influential monastic institute of Larangar, to return to their home areas in the Tibet Autonomous Region and elsewhere as part of more oppressive uh, policies controlling religious activity. And uh, upon return, we've uh, noted that monks and nuns have been held in re-education centers for weeks and months, and effectively a new version of the re-education through labor system that China says it abolished in 2013. So the third pay phase of the um, stability maintenance uh, campaign um, was undertaken from around 2013, and that involved the comprehensive activation of total surveillance and securitization in preempting possible um, protest activity, also preempting religious or cultural activities not sanctioned by the state or expressions of Tibetan identity that do not conform to those specified by the party. So Chen Guanguo made it clear that the people's deepest loyalties and private thoughts are targeted when he announced punishments of officials on political grounds. And he stated in 2014, those who have fantasies about the 14th Dalai clique, those who follow the 14th Dalai clique, and those party cadres involved in supporting separatist infiltration and sabotage activities will be strictly disciplined and severely punished in accordance with the law. Two years later, in Xinjiang, uh, Chen also launched a campaign against what is described in party language two-faced officials who exhibit political disloyalty, and that resulted in the arrest of many prominent Uyghurs, such as the president of Xinjiang University. So a work team member who was in Tibet at the time of, of Chen's tenure told us that the Chinese authorities have decided that without controlling <laughs> Tibetan thinking and what he characterized as the consciousness sphere, the mission of achieving long-term political stability in Tibet would be impossible. So the official media details specific instances of re-education for instance, it gives an example of grassroots party work in a village in the Tibet Autonomous Region close to the border with India, who were informed of some Tibetans seeking to escape in 2013. And the team immediately conducted what they called an ideological education campaign among the herders, arranging for them to be informers on anyone else they heard about who was trying to escape. And according to the same article, the party team held more than 27,000 re-education sessions in this area. Um, and uh, although that may well be an exaggeration, um, nevertheless, we know that uh, according to accounts of Tibetan newcomers, a handful of which, a um, handful of whom escaped last year, they confirmed that because of this network of informers and the intensified militarization in this area, um, hardly anybody has been able to escape from Tibet on foot in recent years, even though an average of two and a half thousand, three and a half thousand, including some of you in this room, um, used to do so before the crackdown in 2008. So the practice of turning villagers into informers and setting neighbors against neighbors has been replicated, of course, in Xinjiang where the system of party cadres in people's homes has been re-established. And um, actually I forgot to include a, a picture of um, two party cadres actually in bed um, with a couple in, uh, in Xinjiang, um, which was depicted by the, the Chinese state media as uh, being you know, part of their roles and responsibilities. So uh, more than a million Chinese civilians mostly ethnic Chinese, have been mobilized to aid the military and police in their campaign in Xinjiang to be resident in the homes of, of Uyghurs and other Muslim minorities. And often they present themselves in party discourse as older siblings of the men and women they might then decide to consign to the camps. And uh, Darren Byler has written some extremely good articles based on his interviews about 
um, uh, about this, this network. Um, and uh, he said that uh, the Uyghurs who had Chinese living in their homes described themselves as feeling infantilized, infantilized and stripped of their dignity. Many of them told me every aspect of their life felt like a political test. None of them seemed to have any hope that their relatives would notice the sadness and difficulty of their lives and therefore refused to carry out their orders to re-engineer Uyghur society. And if we can just imagine that a moment with this number of people working and living in people's homes and in the most intimate aspects of people's lives, and yet Uyghurs who were interviewed believe that absolutely none of these individuals would notice the sadness and difficulty of their lives. So the same methodologies have been developed with increasing rigour in the Tibetan monastic system. So it's no longer enough to, uh, that work trains provide training for monks and nuns. Now individual monks are required to adopt roles in training others to be reliable in politics. So Tibetan Buddhist monks and nuns are now required to be facilitators for the training of others. And last year the Global Times reported on a training course in Lhasa where monks and nuns were being trained to be facilitators in order to strengthen their political beliefs. So there's been a new uh, campaign called the Four Standards um, which is testing monks and nuns political reliability. And this is being promoted throughout the Tibet Autonomous Region. Um, and it's regarded as only through the four standards, not through religious rigour or scholarly attainments, only through the four standards that a monk can advance. So it's a concrete action that must be undertaken in order to meet Xi Jinping's requirements for the religious community under the so-called new era. So, and this is all the underpinnings of all of this, the, the obsessive mantra is the mantra of long-term stability. And this has come to mean not only total compliance to Chinese Communist Party policy and the crushing of dissent, but also really the creation <coughs> of a society in which dissent is not even thought about as ideas that differ from those of the party state are seen as the root causes of instability. So, under measures developed by Chen Quanguo, in, in accordance with top-level instructions to sinicize Tibetan Buddhism, thousands of party cadres have been assigned to live in monasteries as well as people's homes. And Chen, as you will all know, has also presided over a tightening of control of reincarnation. And the publication of a database um, of lamas who are allowed to reincarnate with government permission. <coughs> and that was uh, in 2016. And this has been a key element of the party's attempts to seize control over any future uh, succession issue. And this was a move that was intended to, um, as one of the prominent Communist Party officials said, strike a heavy blow to the Dalai Lama. <coughs> it was really a literal example of breaking their lineage. So the intrusion into a deeply political sphere by Chen was also epitomized by the, by the promotion of marriages between Chinese and Tibetans in order to promote ethnic unity um, and an emphasis in 2014 and 15 on the importance of good relations with Chinese settlers including troops stationed on the plateau. So it's really an illustration this of the policy direction that's emphasized by Xi Jinping known as ethnic mingling or fusion. And at a ceremony for mixed marriages of Tibetans and Chinese couples, Chen made explicit references to uh, back up and underline Xi Jinping's assertion on the importance of ethnic mingling, um, representing a real push towards the greater integration of Tibetans into the Chinese party state and the downgrading of their culture and religion. So also reflecting his military background in the PLA, 
Chan has also led efforts towards the integration of civilians and military. And that's the bedrock of the systematic new measures involving working at a grassroots level in people's homes and monasteries. So, and these come together, these initiatives come together with um, an event that was held recently in Qinghai in which um, involved both civilians and uh, soldiers and uh, a workers committee played the role of matchmaker um, and at this event the All China Women's Federation Workers Committee um, conscientiously in state media speak organized and propagandized the modern military person's dedication to the motherland actively guiding young singles within the agencies towards establishing a correct view of love and marriage as well as vigorously pursuing a highly ethical life and creating a rich <coughs> atmosphere of friendship. So, I mean, from what we know according to Tibetan sources, this official campaign promoting intermarriage has been a very limited success. Um, there may be increasing numbers of these sort of marriages, but that's not probably um, down to the party dictates. That's happening naturally, um, not as a result of Chen Kuang Guo matchmaking. But the approach in uh, Xinjiang has been much more zealous. Um, and um, in August 2017, uh, there was a Uyghur Han marriage and family incentive strategy. <coughs> and that marked um, really the first time in about 68 years that uh, the government explicitly proposed increasing intermarriage between the majority Han and the Uyghur people. So, as we've seen, this systematic machinery of compliance has very deep roots and the term brainwashing was first used as a translation of the Chinese colloquialism Xinao, meaning wash brain. Um, when we think <coughs> of the, the phrase, engineers of the human soul, and uh, I'm sure that, that everybody here will know that this, this was um, a phrase coined by Joseph Stalin, in which he said, the production of souls is more important than the production of tanks. And therefore, I raise my glass to you, writers, the engineers of the human soul. And that uh, really represented a, uh, a machine designed to forge unity between the state, the society, and the individual. And Mao also appropriated this phrase of engineers of the human soul in a different way. Um, and he talked about ensuring that literature and art fit into the whole revolutionary machine as a component part um, and that they help people fight the enemy with one heart and one mind. So as we can see the CPC never sought to really persuade um, or to encourage rectification literally means to break from within. So John Gono points out that in classical Chinese statecraft there are two tools for gaining and maintaining control over the mountains and the rivers. And the first is Wu, weapons or violence, and the second is Wen, which represents language and culture. And now these two elements, propaganda and security, um, the pen and the gun, are now once again um, inseparable in 21st century China. And if we take particularly document 9, this, um, this internal Communist Party document that began to circulate in 2014, um, then this was uh, epitomizing this um, integration of the pen and the sword, disseminating thought on the cultural front was the most important task. So, Interpet, so Xi Jinping has pushed ideology and security both to the fore. And in Tibet, um, we've been monitoring it, it really does appear that there are not the same, um, there isn't the same system of mass internment um, as we're seeing in Xinjiang for various reasons, which perhaps we can, we can discuss later. Um, but we are monitoring uh, new institutions that are being set up. For instance, a couple of months ago, early this year, 
um, a new training camp for party cadres was set up in Shigatsi um, under paramilitary supervision and that aimed to correct and to mould the thinking of party cadres all working across the Tibetan community. There was um, a Tibet youth palace has been set up in Lhasa to strengthen patriotic education among young people and that was that's to be opened I think this month in May. We've also monitored a new vocational training centre in Tower. So we're trying to keep close track of these different uh, institutions because what they represent is, is a deepening institutionalisation of the current policy model in both Tibet and Xinjiang combining coercive securitisation and militarisation with efforts to accelerate political and cultural transformation. And the language used is, is really striking. Um, and the Chinese state media report about the new institute in Shigatsi, for instance, um, refers to the importance of party cadres um, changing their attitudes, not just superficially, not just reciting slogans, but really in terms of achieving um, a complete ideological shift. And they, they use physical terms like people getting a sweaty face and um, a red face. Um, and they mean to show that emotions should be involved in this uh, conversion. Um, they have to really feel the ideological imperative. Um, and in a document from Tibet from the area of Malo, um, we, we monitored uh, four conditions for unrest which the party is seeking to target which also uses interesting language these these four conditions were the influence of the dalai clique the basic level of education among tibetans and what they referred to as the psychological peculiarity of tibetans um, and then the fourth component which party cadres had to watch out for was the densely religious mentality of Tibetan people. So Chen Kuanguo was one of the first senior party officials to speak of Xi Jinping as the core of the party leadership. And he wasted no time upon his arrival in Tibet in presenting himself as politically deeply loyal, um, someone who could be really entrusted to implement hardline measures. And his language also immediately echoed that of a United Workfront official, Hu Lian He, who's become known as an architect of the much harsher, much more coercive policies in Tibet and Xinjiang. And Hu Lian He, who has been present on the international stage, who was in Geneva last year at the UN, denying the existence of the camps in Xinjiang, he has warned against official complacency He's called upon party officials to wake up and he's described the frontier regions of Tibet and Xinjiang as a grave and present danger to national security. And the alignment of China's two major ethnic minority regions um, in these policy statements really represents a further hardening um, towards Tibet and Xinjiang from the Beijing leadership. And that's one that Chen's leadership has effectively trialed through those extreme methods of oppression. So policy and position papers that are produced in the PRC that we've been seeking to monitor as much as possible reveal a new narrative of ramped up rhetoric um, against both Tibet and Xinjiang. Um, and one recent paper in a police journal that we translated stated that the current threat of violent terrorism faced by our country comes primarily from Tibet independence forces and the three evil forces in Xinjiang. And the same paper directly blamed the Dalai Lama in exile as leader of the Tibetan independence elements who have fled abroad. So, this paper was making a direct correlation between the incidents of violence in Xinjiang, for instance the attacks at Kunming train station in 2004, together with the overwhelmingly peaceful resistance and protests in Tibet. And Hu Lian has approached, together with another influential policy analyst, Hu An Gang, 
has focused on the need for effective so-called stability maintenance to incorporate political, cultural, spiritual and ideological issues. So if we look at the writings of both Hu Lianhe and Hu and Gang, they set out a framework in which the Chinese party state is the main agent in any ethnic identity construction. It's literally a state-manufactured ethnic fusion or mingling. And uh, many various academics have looked at this issue, notably Vanessa Frangeville in Brussels, um, analyzing a striking correlation between the language used by um, the policy architects Hu Lianhe and Hu Angang with the language used by Xi Jinping in recent years and months. So there's no doubt that these um, analysts have been very influential indeed. So this is the second generation Minzu, or nationality or ethnic group policy. So, and the idea is that the differences that divide Han Chinese and Tibetans and Uyghurs should be eliminated. And the pictures I've been showing you have been mainly of the counter-terror uh, campaigns in Tibetan areas, um, Hu Lianhe played a very key role in contributing to China's 2015 counter-terrorism law, um, as well as the uh, Xinjiang Uyghur local counter-terrorism law in 2016, and also uh, Xinjiang's anti-extremism regulations of 2017. And uh, what this effectively did was to um, conflate the expression of distinct religious and cultural ethnic identities with separatism and to blur the distinctions between violent acts and peaceful dissent. And so that means that the Chinese government has used counter-terror as a justification to crack down on even mild expressions of um, religious and cultural identity. And the sweeping measures introduced in this law appear to be focused less on protecting, te preventing terror and protecting Chinese citizens, much more on the elimination of dissent, of course, and enforcement of compliance to Chinese Communist Party policies. And the use of extremist language in these uh, initiatives is, of course, vastly disproportionate to any actual threat. So, Linked to um, Party Secretary Chen's tenure in Tibet, um, we've also tracked and um, are tracking close collaboration between the military um, and security officials, particularly in the Tibet Autonomous Region and in Xinjiang. And that reflects again Beijing's alignment of Tibet and Xinjiang as hotbeds of terrorism. So, um, the, I mean, just to give an idea of the language which applies to both, the Xinjiang Communist <coughs> Youth League um, summarized this um, in, with a medical metaphor, saying, if we do not eradicate religious extremism at its roots, the violent terrorist incidents will grow and spread all over like an incurable malignant tumor. And although a certain number of people who have been indoctrinated with extremist ideology have not committed any crimes, they are already affected by the disease. So we must be clear that going into a re-education hospital for treatment is not a way of locking them up for punishment. It is an act that is part of a comprehensive rescue mission to save them. So... In terms of the collaboration between Xinjiang and Tibetan security forces, um, we've, we've found that um, troops are working together in the border regions, even to the extent that troops from Xinjiang and troops from the TAR are even working out together um, in gyms which are equipped by, with interactive game machines. Um, and that train muscles to work at a high altitude and that uh, are also looking at combating the very tough um, conditions up in what they call the snow island. Um, so the gyms are equipped with the latest equipment such as um, they're called apparently somatosensory interactive games and they're aimed at activating the whole body and senses in order to train major muscle groups. So this is something that uh, they're looking at very, very seriously. 
um, equipping people to be combat ready. Um, already joint drills are held by Xinjiang and Tibetan public security forces um, and uh, we recently saw pictures in the state media of um, long endurance drones that were recently tested over Mount Everest with the aim of bolstering security in both regions. And it's part of uh, Xi Jinping's reforms to the PLA um, that the reconstituted, reconstituted sorry, West Zone military region merges Lanzhou and Chengdu military regions. And that represents a strengthened military formation to tackle the party's key concerns over stability in Tibet and Xinjiang. So the Western Theatre Command of the PLA oversees the regions of both Xinjiang and Tibet and it handles border issues with India. And in 2016 the ranking of the Tibet Military Command was raised a level higher than its counterparts, provincial level military commands, by putting it under the jurisdiction directly of the PLA. So, Tibet, unusually, com I mean, compared to Xinjiang, this is different to Xinjiang because what we see in Tibet is an extreme control state coexisting with uh, mass Chinese domestic tourism. Very different to, to Xinjiang in that respect. And under Chen, Lhasa, which was once Tibet's cultural and historic heart, has been dramatically remodeled as an urban hub of hyper-securitization at the same time as the acceleration of the tourist boom. So satellite images of Lhasa, like this one from Google Earth, um, reveal numerous buildings that are labelled as neighbourhood committees. And despite the anodyne title, they act as the, an integral element of the machinery of enforced compliance with party policy and they bring security operations to a grassroots level to fight the influence of what the Chinese term the Dalai clique. And this is, um, this is a part of the grid management which Chen brought to Tibet, and that involves human mobilization in neighborhood committees combined with high-tech surveillance. And that's based on breaking down each urban area into very small units enabling the authorities to identify anything unusual, to target individuals, to prevent the spread of ideas or information or actions that may counter those of the party. And it relies upon big data analytics connecting a network of CCTV cameras with police databases in order to ensure total blanket surveillance. And the system has really dramatically expanded in scope recently and potentially targets all Tibetans and all Uyghurs, entire ethnic populations. And that's assisted by new technology using facial recognition supplied by Hikvision that can distinguish ethnic minorities from Han Chinese. And uh, this has recently been the subject of um, discussion. It's been raised in British Parliament. Um, because uh, an article by The Intercept online publication revealed <coughs> that uh, Portcullis House, which is the parliamentary overspill um, building was look at Westminster, was looking towards getting Hikvision cameras um, installed, um, which would basically provide easy, easily um, backdoor security through the Chinese state. Um, and uh, so far, Portcullis House hasn't gone ahead with the order, um, but in the process it was revealed that even while parliamentarians were raising the issue of concern over Chinese security cameras, already there are hick vision cameras in British Parliament, in, in Westminster, the Palace of Westminster apparently. So this, this uh, video released by hick vision shows um, an individual captured on camera identified as an ethnic minority and it referred to a case study trial of hick vision at Wutai Shan which is, of course, a sacred pilgrimage location for Buddhists. Um, and uh, while Hikvision has not yet marketed this, um, it's been verified from information at a World Summit on AI. So before being installed in prison camps in Xinjiang, the same Hikvision cameras were installed on the Qinghai Lhasa Railway, another example of how methods in Tibet were trialed. Um, in Tibet before Xinjiang. 
Um, and we've also found advertisements for jobs with Hikvision online um, in its LASA office calling for candidates with a background in security. So the development of um, a capacity to use big data analytics in real time has expanded exponentially in Tibet, um, including to monitor tourism dynamics. So, and uh, recently the Global Times um, referred to this big data analysis of tourism um, and it talked again about the conflation of tourism with the security needs of the state. Um, developing tourism in Tibet, they said, is also an important move in safeguarding regional stability and guarding against separatist forces. So, underlining um, the parallel security me measures in Tibet and Xinjiang, we've also, I'll go back to that one in a minute, um, yeah, we also monitored uh, the installation of QR codes there um, on uh, some houses in Tibet, um, and this representing a sort of feedback surveillance loop because they've been installed on houses in, in uh, Xinjiang in 2017. And the idea is that the codes can be scanned by officials on mobile devices in order to get instant access to the personal details of people living there. Um, and uh, the state media article introducing these said that in the era of the um, mobile internet, the public WeChat account for Village Affairs has made the transmission of information much smoother and people are more assured and satisfied. I'll just quickly go back to this one. So, in the new system, as we've seen, each neighbourhood is divided into three or more grid units. Um, they have a special tracking of people according to the interests of the party state. Special groups include political prisoners, former political prisoners, monks, nuns, people who have returned from India also people who have been expelled from monasteries and nunneries or those involved in political protests. So the military um, aspect of the grid management is, is very, very clear and has been spelt out by Chinese theorists. Um, and of course an integral element of it is the establishment of uh, police posts as well. There are hundreds of police posts for surveillance set up now in Lhasa and across all urban and rural areas. And they're constructed in concrete and bulletproof glass. This system has been, of course, replicated in Xinjiang. Um, between 2011 and 2015, the uh, TAR established more than 698 convenience police stations and checkpoints um, established 300 to 500 metres apart. And this was all monitored by scholars like Adrian Zentz, um, looking at procurement notices and um, tenders for employment. So between, again, 2011-2016, coinciding exactly with Chen Quang Guo's tenure, um, the TAR advertised 12,313 policing-related positions over four times as many as the last five years. So Chen also trained the security forces using a technique developed in Tibet, which was timing police to the second in responding to emergency calls. And this has been replicated to what the Chinese would characterize as political emergencies too. Um, and one friend of mine in India, Tibetan friend in India, who's related to a, a political prisoner, um, said that even if he simply spoke to his family in the TAR on the phone, the police would arrive at the house to question the family within 10 minutes. And he said that that time was getting shorter and shorter. So the same principles of militarized management apply also to all religious institutes across Tibet. So it does seem as though now that the grid management system is established across Tibet, and now that a system of total surveillance has been set up, the Chinese authorities do seem to have pulled back a more overt and visible security presence in some areas, such as troops in monasteries. 
So big data analysis and militarized management of communities, together with the awareness that forces can be deployed within seconds or minutes if any protest occurs, gives the authorities the ability to respond in real time to any incidents perceived by the party as threatening, such as protests or self-immolation. And that's buttressed by the leadership focus upon broader and deeper control measures, for instance, in the religious sphere. And uh, these slides were, were just to show um, the ways in which the control state is established so deeply in urban areas. And that's a picture of um, Gutsa Detention Center, which was one of the most notorious detention centers um, in Tibet, in Lhasa, um, next to the Intercontinental Hotel um, in Lhasa, which is that sort of snow peak um, design. Um, this is an image of uh, Chushu, Chushu <coughs> Prison um, in, uh, in Lhasa, which is the newest prison in 2015. It largely took over as the center for um, political prisoners following Drapchi Prison. And this image shows, um, uh, this is interesting because we, we sought to look at some satellite images of uh, some of the prisons and detention facilities in Lhasa recently just to see if we could show any major new institutions that might be being set up along the lines of what's happening in Xinjiang. And what we found is the image on the left is, is the Trisam reform through labor camp in 1993. 2013, the Chinese say that they eliminated reform through labor camps. Um, but it seemed as though Trisam in 2018, we were able to track it um, as being set up in three distinct areas, um, expanded and modernized. Now, we don't know, but it could well be that that may still be being used for for re-education and perhaps as a center for, for holding people. So just to, to conclude here, um, what we're seeing is a shift in the both the institutional and the policy direction <coughs> emanating from Beijing. And what it suggests is that what's happening in Tibet and Xinjiang is at the cutting edge, the leading edge, of a new, much more coercive ethnic <coughs> policy under Xi Jinping's new era of Chinese power. And as we've seen, it's one that seeks to accelerate the political and the cultural transformation of non-Han ethnic minorities. And almost every policy that we see in Tibet today is aiming towards the evisceration, <laughs> the, the real evisceration or elimination of what is distinctive and most unique about Tibetan and Uyghur identity. Stability is the new norm, and the Chinese state decides what is normal. And these ethnic policy shifts are informed and underpinned by the securitization discourse. Of course, under this system, no one, Tibetans or Uyghurs, feels, safe, feels more safe, feels safer. So, we can see with the, with the language that the Communist Party uses, um, the levels of, um, they, they can define um, as they like what is, what is normal. So, for instance, one term would be people who accept remote control from the Dalai Lama. Um, and we've, we've heard of various incidents, various stories which underline the grassroots level at which these top-down central policies are being um, imposed. Um, there were some stories recently about um, a group of Tibetans who bailed out water from the Jokhang temple after a flood and uh, they were all arrested and beaten up because this was defined as, um, as